5.30 in the morning, A.J. Ariano arrives at school, football practice, in honor of his dad. I just know that he's watching me. It helps me with playing better, you know? 5.45 a.m., Trey Burroughs is about to leave for work. This is like actually happening to us. 6 a.m., his sister Jenny up two. They are now raising their two sisters, hoping to make their mother proud. Let's go. On this day, Jenny gets the girls to school. Across this country, the young people showing their resilience. Kylie Coney walking down the hallway in high school. Everything happened so suddenly and so fast. Her brother Colton with his backpack. Life without their dad. Cornelia Bell getting on the school bus, a first grader now without her mother and her father. Four-year-old Elsie, two-year-old Graham, out the door before the sun comes up, barely old enough to remember their father. Good morning, Elsie. Good morning, Graham. Even the youngest are learning what loss means. Love you. For months now, we have witnessed the quiet strength of the children facing a new day without a parent. More than 250,000 children here in the U.S. have lost a parent or a primary caregiver in this pandemic. Their parents' voices, though, still echo. AJ's father at every game. Yeah! Trey and Jenny, their mother, a single mother of four. <laughs> Kylie and Colton's dad was always so proud. All right, Colton! A big birthday girl. Little Cornelia Jaros singing to her mother on her birthday. All right! The father and his princess, Elsie. <laughs> All of these parents. I love you so much. I love you too. Taken too soon. All of these children and their families have allowed us to follow their journey, their unspeakable pain, their unmatched strength. On this day in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, Colton is about to honor his father. You got a big game today, huh? <laughs> yeah. Are you nervous? Uh, a little bit. Your dad was a big hockey guy. Yeah. He liked the Rangers. Uh, yeah, big fan. So this is the first step in that direction, right? Yeah. <laughs> you got a ways to go. Yeah. What's been the hardest part for you? Not being able to see him every day. Like, it was always good waking up and seeing him. You still think about him every day? Yeah, every day. His sister Kylie, down the hall. What would you say to people watching who don't realize how many kids have lost a parent? I'm just one of like so many. What's it been like? It's been really hard, like literally changed my entire life. I've really tried to like live my life more because tomorrow really isn't promised. You find yourself still talking to your dad? Sometimes I'll text him and I think that that helps me. It's kind you of, still text him? Yeah, it's like my way of communicating. It is bittersweet because I know I'm not gonna get a reply back. The sunset she sent her father. What did he say? Thank you for the beautiful sky, I miss you. Oh. Yeah. Did you know your mom has been doing the same thing? No, I did not. <laughs> yeah, you caught me. A mother in the hallway listening. What was the hardest part about what you just heard? Just knowing how much that they miss him and still think of him every day. Janice Coney, now raising her children on her own. I started sleeping on his side of the bed because I couldn't bear rolling over at night and seeing that empty spot. And in the morning, you know, tell him I'm ready to start the day and do the best that I can as, as a mom, and then I'll take care of our kids. May he be proud. I hope, I hope so, yeah. Upstairs, Colton getting ready for hockey. His father's Rangers hat right there on Colton's dresser. And his father's pins, his rings. His father was a Marine. One of his favorite hats, and then pins and necklaces and rings from the Marines. I heard you got his flag. Yeah. Yeah. Is that a tough moment? Yeah, definitely. We hear about the numbers, 
Rarely do we see the moment a child says goodbye to their parent. Please accept this flag as a token of appreciation for your loved one's faithful and honorable service. Colton was just 12, his hand reaching for his father's flag. Summer Fidelis. Happy birthday, dear Their father, Eric Coney, died at just 51. He and his wife both had COVID. And Eric died the day they got the call, saying the vaccines were now available for them. Kylie was just 14 when both of her parents were in the hospital, and she was the one taking the calls. They literally had to decide whether they went to the hospital or not. Just such a lot of pressure on my plate. The children have been keeping diaries for months. I feel like it's hard to think that like the world can go on without him. Hey dad, it's Friday night. I uh, had a rough week this week. Miss you a lot. Love you. Colton now heads out the door for the hockey game his father would have loved. How are the pregame nerves? Uh, a little nervous. A little nervous? Okay. All right. His mother on the other side of the fence. So it's the Lindhurst Bears, right? Yeah. All right, we'll be rooting for the Bears today. One, two, three, Bears! Go, go. And Kylie on the cheer team. <laughs> Every day in this country, the children facing their fears and their loss. In Boynton Beach, Florida, Trey Burroughs and his siblings starting another day without their mother. I wake up at 5.30, take a shower, and hopefully I have a little bit of time to read my Bible and eat a bit of food. I'm studying to become a firefighter. Cindy Dawkins, a single mother of four, died from COVID. She had been afraid of the vaccine. Once I got the news, which was over the phone, um, like obviously I cried and I was super sad and my mind went to my sisters. How are we gonna like make sure we all stay together? How are we gonna pay for everything? Like what's all of that gonna look like? Found out she had COVID one day, the next day she was gone. How am I supposed to tell my little sisters that our mom isn't coming home? Jenny and her brother Trey are now the parents. We're making good time this morning. She fixes Sierra's makeup. Okay, perfect. Zoe, getting ready too. Really don't have much time for a lot of other things. Because I have like more of a responsibility to my sisters now, I'm always thinking, like, I'm kind of, like, I'm kind of thinking like a parent now. I'm always thinking about, do they have food? Am I spending enough time with them? My mom used to handle everything. We look at our bills and we're like, how did she do all of this? This is ridiculous. The grocery was always in the house. Light, um, lights, um, water bill, everything was always paid. I don't know how other people are doing it. Cause I know it's not just us. So I just hope everybody else has help. Early on, the harsh new reality, the bills. You were prepared to be homeless. Oh, yes, 100%. Our biggest thing was just trying to keep everybody together. And if we had to hide it and be homeless, sleep in the car, that was perfectly fine. We were going to do what we had to do. And then the help from the angels. <laughs> it came, thankfully. Miss Cheney. Exactly. This is the, the Broward receipt for the best. Oh, right. Janey Yoshida knew these children needed someone, her daughter, had been in the school play okay. with Trey. We have to file a final tax return for your mom. We do? We do. I'll do all the taxes, so just, why don't you get all that stuff together? Uh -huh. You can bring that tomorrow. Okay, perfect. I'll she told them I'll she would help with the rent, the paperwork, their mother's taxes. We just keep moving on. We're very close. Very close. Yeah, we're very close. Janie started a GoFundMe for the children, hoping to keep them together. We'll reconvene tomorrow. There's still many days when I'm, I'm sure you don't understand. Of course. Just with everyday things in life, not including this whole situation, sometimes you just, I don't know what to do, so I'm just going to trust that you know what you're doing. You're growing up quickly. <laughs> Very quickly, yeah. Trey and Jenny have a plan. He becomes a firefighter, 
and then she becomes a dental hygienist. I mean, you guys have planned this all out? Yes. It's been tough. I'm okay with saying that now. It's been tough. I've been trying to balance being a sister, being a parental figure. How's that going? It's, it's going. <laughs> right now it's going. I had a hard time admitting that I felt kind of guilty because I felt very like tired, stressed out, just wanting to be by myself sometimes. It is okay. Yeah. And who's looking out for you? Honestly, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. And in our months following these children, we notice something else. Every day, Jenny and her mother's necklace. This is her her necklace. I don't I don't feel right not wearing it. I've worn it every day since. I got it from the hospital, so. She was wearing that when she went to the hospital? Yeah, yeah. This is the first thing that they handed to me. And ever since then, I've had it. Every one of these children carries their parent with them. It's 5 a.m. and A.J. Ariano is up. He knows that's what his father would have wanted. He's off to football practice. Every morning, to drive to school before the sun comes up. So it's 5.24 in the morning. We have morning football practice. Spring's just starting now. E.J. Ariano lost his father. His voice still drives him. What time did you get here? Yeah, yeah, 5.35. Yeah? Yeah. And you watched the sun come up? Right, yep. His father, Alan, was just 49. He'd had his first shot of the vaccine, and he was waiting on the second. Part of why you're here is your dad, right? Yeah, definitely. You think about him every day? Every day, especially when I wake up. AJ still remembers when he learned he'd lost his father. Our father, who are in heaven. The first game of the season, AJ was in Georgia. His father was in the hospital in a coma, and AJ had sent him a message. Hi, Daddy, it's me, AJ. I want to let you know that I'm here with you every day and I love you a lot, and I really do miss you. Tomorrow's my game against Benedictine, and I'm gonna play really good for you, Dad. I love you. When I got home from the long bus ride back home from Georgia at around 4 or 5 a.m., um, I learned the news from my, my mom as soon as I walked through the door. She was just crying hysterically, and I kinda knew, so I just gave her a hug. I, like, I didn't feel, I, did, I kinda didn't feel for, for like a good 30 seconds. It was just like, like I was just frozen, kind of stuck. Numb. Numb, yeah. It just didn't make sense. Like, how could that happen, you know? So I just went upstairs, and I just remember just crying all night, all night. And grateful you had sent that video. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's been nine months now without his father, and we take note of what keeps AJ going. Before every game, you go to the sideline? Yeah, right over there. And what do you do? Well, I say a little prayer and I talk to my dad just like I would before every game. He'd give me a, he'd give me a phone call, so I just act like I'm on the same phone call, and I just hear him talking back with me, and I know that he's watching me, so I know that I can play the game without any worries. You still hear his voice? Yeah, definitely. His mother Karen is always there for him, and his younger brother Evan. Karen is also there for her husband. I feel like now my job is really to live for both of us. Hi, Teddy. Because I too don't like to miss anything. So I, I sit here for both of us. I sit here and I watch for both of us. And I cheer for both of us. Karen knows she must now get the boys to college. But for now, she's just getting through the month. This is my reality right now. Um, this is my to-do list, uh, bills that need to be paid. Her husband was a college counselor. Karen is a kindergarten teacher. And now, it's her salary alone. Because I'm not unemployed, I did not qualify for mortgage assistance. So I'm currently trying to figure out how I'm going to 
continue to keep the roof over our head so my children have a safe place. With my income, after I pay the mortgage, I have $200 left. That doesn't include the water, the electricity, the food. As a teacher, with a teacher salary, it's, um, it's kind of overwhelming. The crush of responsibility when a parent is lost. On the Shakta Reservation in Mississippi, the scope of the loss is devastating. It's time. Come on, let's go find your clothes. The little girl who lost both parents, her aunt, waking her up for school. You want to wear the dress? Okay. My Lindy Bell now raising her seven-year-old niece, Cornelia Jaros. You got your jacket? Where's your jacket and your mask? Her parents, Craig and Mindy Bell, died just three months apart, both getting COVID before the vaccines were ready. Cornelia Jaros was just five when she lost her parents. That's Melinda in the blue jacket, and that's Tashta in the black jacket. They're my mom and daddy, but they died. <sighs> so. My auntie and them had to pick me up. She's now in the first grade. See you later, baby. Where's my kiss? <laughs> what about Peppa? I want another kiss. What about Peppa? I want another kiss. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> <Bye -bye. laughs> Don't forget, your money's in your book bag. At school, we notice the classrooms are still nearly empty. Jaros is now just one of seven in her class. So many of the children on this reservation have lost the parents, the grandparents, who used to bring them. My mom's in the quarter, and so is my cousin Veronica and her husband, and they too passed away from COVID a week apart from each other. It is tradition here when a loved one dies to wait one year before going back to the home Whatever you don't want to keep, put it in here, okay? We're there as Cornelia DeRose goes back to her bedroom with her toys. The photos of her parents still on the refrigerator. And my Lindy is about to bring her niece to the COVID memorial on the reservation. Look, they made this cross for those that passed from COVID. So like Mamo and your mama, it is an honor of them. She asks, what does honor mean? It's honor me. Like, honoring people, you know, because they've passed. You want me to read it? Okay, it says, the Mississippi Band of Choctaw Indians dedicated to those, the lives of those lost to the COVID-19 pandemic. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen your heart, all ye that hope in the Lord. How do you explain death and loss? to the youngest of the children. In Waldwick, New Jersey, Pamela Addison, now raising Elsie and Graham alone. Her husband, Martin, died before the vaccines were available. His last birthday with Elsie, she was turning two. Should we make your birthday cake now? Should we finish it? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, nice job, Elsie. Your cake looks so pretty. Oh, no. Graham was just five months old. Martin's laying next to him and he just says, I love you. And I'm so happy I have that because you don't, he didn't get to really hear that often. So that would be a really special video when he's old enough to understand. And as we followed this young family. You need a hug? I love you. We learned that Elsie's first time saying I love you came while in the car, and her mom says she was talking to her dad in heaven. That was the first time she ever said I love you because that was like the stage that she finally understood what love was, and he missed that. She says her daughter, now four, is carrying the weight of this. She gets sad when people leave. Like if we have like a little gathering, like her, her third birthday, she told me she was sad after, and we're like, why are you sad? She goes, because everyone left. You know, it's like that abandonment. 
Are we fully aware of, of the loss that children have faced? I don't think so. I really don't. Dr. Susan Hillis is worried about the children too. She spent years at the CDC and has now authored the report, The Hidden Pandemic. There are so many children who, who start their day without a parent now. Breakfast, the walk to the school bus, the school dance. And is there enough being done to make sure that child isn't alone? There is not nearly enough being done, and that's why it's so important that all of us begin to ask these questions. In the United States, for every four COVID deaths, we have one child left behind orphaned of their parent or grandparent caregiver who provided for their needs and nurture. Pamela has now started a Facebook group for other parents who are now raising their children alone. 980 mothers joining already. There you go. Elsie is now about to turn four. She remembers the sprinkles with her father. She definitely knows that this is the time where Papa disappeared. So I just try to, you know, keep a happy face. And, you know, obviously he's in our hearts and we're on our minds. She came up with this theme herself and I know it's like honoring him. As we document these families, Yay! the milestones, the turning points. Feeling so excited. We're just getting everything set up now. Six months after losing their mother, they are now packing. With their two jobs and money raised by that mom, Janie Yoshida, on GoFundMe, they are now about to move into their first home. She always wanted a house for us, so I know she's probably ecstatic right now. They have their own room for the first time ever, so. This is the farmhouse inc. Doesn't have the divider in it. My mom always wanted one like this. So you made dinner already for tonight? Yes, so sure. what is dinner? Um, baked chicken and rice, white rice. I might have to stay a little longer. <laughs> have you become a better cook? I have, I, they've told me that I have, oh, so that's a big thing. That is a big deal. Definitely a big deal. Because they would let you know otherwise too. Oh, definitely. You're channeling your mom's voice now, right? Of course, I hear myself sometimes when I talk and I hear her and I'm like, oh my gosh, wow. <laughs> I am becoming my mother. Yes, I sound exactly like her. As part of his training, we watch as Trey returns from a call with the Palm Beach Gardens Fire Rescue Station 65. It makes me want to do it more and more. Having like people that are basically your family members now going out and saving people together. Like, sounds amazing. Who wouldn't want to do that? I feel confident. Two months later, we're with him for his test. I've studied for two weeks straight for this test, nonstop every day, so. We go to find him after the test at Palm Beach State College. So how'd it go? Yeah, you passed the first one? Yes, sir. You feeling good? Yeah. All right, the smile says it all. <laughs> turning points for all of the families. Cornelia DeRose, her proud aunt, sitting there at school. Cornelia, about to make the honor roll. Cornelia DeRose Bay. She's now finishing the first grade and getting ready for the Shakta's first festival since this pandemic started. They get to choose two dances and they dance in front of the whole community. The community, the children who have lost so much here, together again. And back in Lyndhurst, New Jersey, Kylie and Colton now marking one year without their father. And they're doing it with something their dad loved, mini golf. A hole in one for mom. But one year later, the moments when the pain is still raw. A relative posting a tribute to their father on Facebook. Today marks one year since you're gone. A hug for her mother. It's been a painful journey for the parents now doing this alone. Karen Ariano and her boys. Do you hear your husband's voice? I do, I do all the time. I do, I hear him talking to me. I've heard him a lot lately telling me you're doing a good job. So then I take a deep breath and I say, okay, I'm doing a good job. <laughs> and AJ, 
is about to become a senior. On the outside, very good. Hey. Have you thought in your head if you just had you know one more conversation with your dad, if they just gave you one more chance? Yeah. What you would say? I, I mean, I don't even have words to explain what I would say. I would just tell him how much I love him. He was just an amazing person, caring, sweet, kind, humble, and I kind of just lived through his footsteps. You know, I always like to be humble, kind to anyone, no matter what, and make sure everyone's doing good because it makes me feel good. Stay at it. Yes, sir. Focused on football and his grades, too. So you got history? Yeah. Are you ready for history today? I'm ready for history. It's going to be a great day today. Awesome. And from all of the children we have followed, one common theme, please don't forget us. The more than 250,000 children here in the U.S. who have lost a parent or a primary caregiver. In Wall Township, New Jersey, the farm with the growing tribute called Rami's Heart. The stones bearing loved ones' names. Kylie and Colton are there to find their father's name and the speech Kylie is about to give for her father. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Kylie Coney. And for all of the children who've lost a parent. Learning to live without one of the most important people in my life has not only been beyond difficult, but also completely life-changing. Going back to school was and still is the most challenging thing I ever had to conquer. This year, my brother decided to join hockey. We are slowly learning to find happiness in our lives again because that is what he would have wanted for us. Perhaps sharing can let other families know, let other children know that they are not alone. Thank you. That brave speech from a young daughter, words she never thought she would have to write, now standing up for all of the children who've lost a parent and urging this country not to forget. We have been so moved here by all of the children, the families who let us into their homes, into their lives. To learn more about how you can help, go to abcnews.com. I'm David Muir from all of us here at ABC News. Good night. Hi everyone, George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.